The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. At this time, I'd like to introduce Chris Harnett. Hello, I'm Chris Hartnett. I uh, lead the Preservation Engineering Group at Meyer Boardman Johnson. I have to say it's a little tough to, to go third here. I've followed a timing drama, a living legend, and videos. Um, so I'll do the best I can to try to tell an interesting story here. <coughs> Excuse me. This pres presentation describes the engineering achievements over a 50-year period that made it possible for the milling industry to mature from a small town, rural endeavor to a, a multi-billion dollar industry that feeds the entire world. It's a story of the grain elevator, it's early design, construction, successes and failures. From the day that humans left the nomadic uh, life of the farmer and gatherer to tend the farm, there's been a need to grind and store their grain. In the agrarian society, this meant small local grinding mills, often powered by water within a day's wagon ride of each other, spread across the plains. <coughs> Excuse me. Early storage was performed in flat houses, which were simply one-story warehouses in which sacks of grain were stored between the fall harvest and its use in baking or brewing throughout the year. In flat houses, the grain was packaged in burlap sacks. It was a unit of storage that was easy to lift and transfer from mill to wagon to storehouse. If kept dry, the burlap sacks allowed the grain to dry and tended to, prevent, to protect against spoilage. Its protection against insect and rodent infestation is questionable. Over time, the flat houses morphed into early elevators that used mechanical conveyors to raise the grain into tall storage bins for sorting and storage and for easy loading into wagons. The grain elevators provided two purposes. They served two purposes, the storage of the grain and the transport of grain within the mill or between various vehicles such as a wagon, truck, rail car, or ships. While the majority of this presentation deals with the storage of the grain and the construction of the storage bins, it's useful to understand the transport of grain at early ports to understand the development of the grain elevator. On the waterfront, grain destined for distant lands made a few stops before departing by sea. The sacks of grain were loaded from the wagon to the dock, from the dock onto the deck of the ship, then down into the hold of the ship. This was dependent on the longshoremen or stevedores who were often drunk and always unruly. Eventually this system was replaced by mechanical steel legs that transported the grain through a series of scoops on a belt or chain that passed over sprockets, one end buried in the grain and the other above a chute that directed the grain into the hold of a ship. As an engine rotated the sprockets, the buckets on the chain bit into the grain at the lower sprocket and discharged it over the upper sprocket. You can see there the this is actually a ship here, and these are the legs going up into the elevator. Joseph Dart was, was credited with creating the first industrial scale elevator in 1843 in Buffalo, New York. He developed this mechanism and mounted it on a rigid frame that could be raised and lowered as a complete unit by ropes and pulleys. Eventually, this elevator mechanism was housed in its own building, which was the beginning of the grain elevator as we know it. There's two types of grain elevators, the country elevators and the terminal elevators. Country elevators were spread across the prairie in rural communities, usually separated by a day's wagon ride. They allowed storage of the grain from harvest to processing and use. Country elevators also provided a means for financial tra transactions, as the farmer often sold the grain to the elevator operator who cleaned, sorted, and stored it, then resold it to the, to the railroad or to the end user. These elevators were relatively small, generally storing 
25,000 to 35,000 bushels of grain, sometimes as much as 100,000 bushels of grain. I think I'm ahead one. Uh, by the way, a bushel is approximately 1.2 cubic feet of volume, or the equivalent of 9.3 gallons of liquid, or given, the, given that it's grain, 72 pints of beer. Of course, the storage bins had to be strong against the horizontal pressure of the tall column of grain above. There were two types of early grain elevators, the crypt construction, where the sides of the bins were formed by plank laid flatwise, usually two inches thick and spiked together with long vertical spikes the plank often running through a distance of three and sometimes four bins. This arrangement adds to the stiffness in resisting the bulging tendency of the grain. The second is the studded construction, which is the standard balloon frame construction that we use today. And while wood was an excellent early material for smaller elevators, it had its limitations and its problems, as Megan mentioned before. Wood elevators were prone to fire, and they typically lasted only five to ten years. They were prone to overstress. Because of this, the cost of fire insurance over the life of the elevator raised the, the final cost of wood construction to that of more expensive steel and concrete bins. They were also too small to respond to the rapid growth in transportation capacity and speed that occurred at the end of the 19th century. The mid-19th century saw a revolution in transportation with the construction of a rail network across the plains. This tied the small farmer in the rural communities to the large mills and factories in the cities and through shipping to customers around the world. Within 50 years, a typical grain car grew from, 2000, from, from a capacity of 2,000 bushels to as much as 10,000 bushels. The ships grew from a capacity of 20,000 bushels to 250,000 bushels. This required the handling of much larger quantities of grain at a much faster speed. This rapid improvement in the transportation of grain reduced the cost of transporting grain from Duluth to Buffalo from about 20 cents per bushel in 1870 down to 2 cents a bushel at the turn of the century. This change in quantity of grain carried and the reduced price required grain storage and conveying facilities to grow to handle this tenfold increase in production. <coughs> this led to the terminal elevator, which was larger and more complex than the country elevator. While a typical country elevator in the late 1800s stored tens of thousands of bushels, by the early 20th century, a terminal elevator stored upwards of 10 million bushels of grain. Uh -huh. Terminal elevators were typically located in cities, at major rail intersections, and at ports. Because much of the grain in the U.S. is grown in the, in the Great Plains, but the population centers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was the East Coast, the vast majority of terminal elevators were located in the Midwest, along the Mississippi and the Great Lakes. Minneapolis, Chicago, and Buffalo, New York were large um, areas where a large concentration of elevators. The increased size of the terminal elevator resulted in much higher forces that required stronger construction materials. In the 1880s, with the development of the growing availability of steel, large steel vessels were tried as one alternative to wood. These vessels used the same engineering principles as the boilers in locomotives and in steam, furnishes, uh, steam furnaces. Max Tolks, the T of TKDA, when working for James Hill's Nor Great Northern Railroad in 1895, designed and had built steel elevators in Duluth, Superior, and in Buffalo, New York, with capacities over 2 million bush bushels. Uh, they were housed in brick buildings of notable architecture. Over time, however, the lack of, of thermal insulating against the harsh winters, moisture condensation, spoilage, and rust made steel grain elevators less than ideal. For a time, masonry tile elevators became popular because they provided thermal insulation, didn't rust, and kept the grain dry. However, their construction was labor-intensive, slow, and, and, and expensive to build. I, I feel like the next two or three slides I should just kind of go through and tear up because Megan's kind of go through, gone through it, but, but I'll do it anyway. When then reinforced concrete came into, onto the scene, Minneapolis took center, center stage and the revolution in construction began. Frank H. P. H. Peavy started in the grain business in Minnesota in the 1870s. He quickly became the largest grain handler in the world by recognizing and capitalizing on the latest technology. In 1899, Peavy hired Charles F. Hagelin, a Minneapolis architect, to design and build an experimental tank in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. The tank was 20 feet in diameter, uh, eventually 124 feet tall. The walls ranged from 12 inches thick at their base down to 5 inches at their top. 
as you've seen before, his uh, patent 662,266 in 1900 showed the following. The forms consisted of curved, in, curved inside and outside wood forms, approximately four feet tall. They were stiffened by wood framed vertical and horizontal strong backs. The inside and outside forms were attached at their top with yokes that, uh, made of steel angles that spanned across and connected the inner and outer forms. These yokes were spaced around the perimeter of the, of the bin. The design included reinforcing steel that consisted of horizontal steel hoops tied to vertical steel bars similar to modern concrete construction. The forms were attached to the bin foundation and concrete was poured between the concentric forms. As soon as the concrete was sufficiently set, the entire mold was raised until the lower ends of the boards overlapped only the extreme upper portions of the section of the bin. Two. It does. Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, that's a, a recent photo of it. It's out on, take 394 out to Highway 100, go south and go about two miles. It's right there. Well, there you go. Okay. To accomplish this, the forms were loosened from the concrete and were raised on lifting screws that bore on the top of the hardened concrete. This method allows for every pour, for one pour every 24 hours, with each new pour raising the elevator, the height of the form. Each day started with the tying of new reinforcing bars atop the previous day's pour, raising the forms and pouring the concrete, which dried overnight. The next day the process was repeated. This method of lifting forms was an important development in the current construction of the concrete grain elevator. It would soon see an improvement that would allow for the construction of enormous new elevators. PB's, PB's um, experimental elevator began construction in the summer of 1899. By fall, the concrete was cured and the elevator was filled with grain and closed for the winter. When they returned in the spring of 1900, they emptied the elevator with great fanfare and a large crowd, some clearly expecting the elevator to implode when the grain began to flow. The grain flowed from the elevator, dry and unspoiled after spending a Minnesota winter in storage. PV's elevator had stood, and it stands today. There I am. One of the concerns of, of PV's design was that, it was, was that it introduced cold joints between each day's pour and the next day's pour above. It was argued that this would introduce weakness into the bins and would prevent them from being watertight. The goal was to somehow pour the entire bin monolithically from foundation to top of bin without any joints. The problem to be solved, of course, was how to raise the forms while the top concrete was still wet. An early solution found adjustable, uh, found adjustable platforms erected within the interior of the bins that supported the forms, and they could be raised gradually, but these were labor-intensive and costly. The breakthrough came when the vertical reinforcing bars were, were replaced with threaded rods and a screw jack was attached to these rods. Instead of waiting for the concrete to dry before raising the form, the form could simply bear on the vertical bars and rise as construction could, uh, progressed. This allowed the weight of the forms, the platform, and the workers to be carried on the vertical steel, the strongest component of the walls. This refinement allowed the tanks to be constructed monolithically, ensuring stronger and more waterproof bins. Once the pour began, it continued until the entire, the entire height of the elevator was complete, as high as 110 feet, a continual pour that lasted as long as three weeks. You can see, you can see the forms here. These are, this is actually standing on top of it on the platform. These are the yokes um, around a bin, and these are the forms below with the yokes above with the workers above there. And it's incredible. I mean, there's 15 of these things, 30 feet, 35, 33 feet wide, all of them being poured monolithically at the same time at the same time, um, you know, all the way up for, you know, three weeks. It's, it's, it's quite an amazing construction, I think. And I, for, for me, it's really the most interesting part of this whole, of this whole uh, system. Is that the first form? These are the first, uh, you, you, you know my speech. Hold on, hang on a minute. We'll take more. The key component of this advancement was the screw jack and the yoke design. At each yoke, the half-inch diameter reinforcing was replaced with a threaded rod that was fed through a screw jack. A laborer stationed at each yoke turned a nut at the top of the screw jack and slowly raised the entire platform as the concrete was poured. Pours were typically made in 6 to 12 inch pours, um, 6 to 12 inch lifts across several bins at one time. This concept of raising a form, allowing it to slip against the face of the still wet concrete, led to the term slip forms. This method ensured a measurable, consistent raising of the forms. The forms rose as much as six, four to six feet per day, or two to three inches per hour. A rule of thumb was to raise the forms no more than twice the height of, of the form per day, which ensured that the concrete would cure at least 12 hours be, be, before being pulled from the form. 
It was found that this rate was reasonable to allow the bending, lifting, and tying of rebar required to build the, the walls. This operation required a delicate balance between, the moving the form, between moving the forms fast enough to prevent the concrete from hardening against the form, causing it to pull the wall apart uh, when it was lifted, and moving slowly enough to allow the green concrete sufficient time to set before removing the form. <clears throat> now, grain can behave strangely when stored in tall vessels. Sometimes it behaves like a solid, bridging over voids below through friction between the grain with a horizontal thrust, thrust resisted by the bend sidewalls. But when this bridging is interrupted, the grain can act like a liquid, a liquid quickly filling the void below. The bottom of the elevator must be designed for this dynamic force. This behavior of, of grain led to a general theory of grain pressures, which provides an equation for the horizontal pressure of the, of the bin based on the type of grain, the height and the diameter of the column of grain. L is the horizontal pressure, W is the unit weight of grain. It's approximately 50 pounds per cubic foot for wheat, and all the constants here are for wheat, wheat grain. R is the ratio of the bin area to perimeter, which is D over 4. F is the friction coefficient of, of wheat on concrete, 0.42. K is the internal friction coefficient for wheat, which is 0.6. H is the diameter of the column of grain. D is the diameter of bin, and E is the constant 2.7, basically 2.72. The two variables in this equation are h over d, the ratio of grain height to bin diameter. Inside, inserting the constant derives the equation L equals 30d times 1 minus 1 over h. As, the height of the, as you can see, the height of the grain, uh, the grain increases, the horizontal maximum pressure L approaches 30d, or 30 times the diameter of the bin as the bin weight approaches, as the bin height approaches infinity. Therefore, for wheat grain, the maximum lateral static pressure um, is is 30 times the bin diameter. So for a 30-foot diameter bin, the maximum pressure is 300, uh, 900 PSF. Pressure is in pounds per square foot when the diameter is in feet. It can be shown that over 97% of the pressure is reached at a grain height that is 3.5 times the diameter. Now the bursting pressure, T, equals 0.5 LD. The required area of steel, A sub S, equals T over F sub S, equals 0.5 LD times F sub S. Now a nomogram, a nomograph presented in uh, September 1920 issue of Concrete Magazine provides one method to design the steel reinforcing, i.e. To, de to determine the vertical spacing of horizontal steel. Starting at a, at a depth of the bin, say 100 feet tall, move to the right until you get to the... So let's see if I can read and do this at the same time. Thanks. 100 feet tall, move to the right until you reach the size bin, say 15 feet, which is there. Then you move up to the... Uh, to the size bar you want, and then you go to the right for the spacing, which is about eight and a half inches. That sure is a whole lot easier than, uh, than some of the equations and spreadsheets that we spent hours and hours working with today. So maybe they made money in their projects, I don't know. <laughs> some engineers use round bars spaced according, to the, spaced according to the pressure, much like we call out reinforcing today. Others used flat bars because they were easier to bend spacing them 12 inches on center, and varying the thickness of the bars based on the bursting pressure. I couldn't find any discussion about the resisting of the higher dynamic forces when the grain broke free, except the mention that a method to deal with these forces was to keep the tensile steel stress below 12,000 PSI under static forces, allowing sufficient residual strength to resist the dynamic forces. Now, no presentation about the history of engineering is complete without a mention of the historic failures, and frankly, that's probably the more, most interesting part of the, of the presentations. Um, the failures described here are by no means a complete list of failures. In fact, it describes only one engineer's failures, but they do shed light on the forces and the caution required with this new system. After Peavy's and Hagelin's successful test of their experimental, experimental elevator in St. Louis Park in 1899, Peavy engaged Hagelin to design a large concrete elevator Duluth, Elevator consisted of 30 reinforced concrete tanks, 33 feet 6 in diameter by 104 feet tall, arranged in six rows of five bins. The first 15 bins were poured monolithically in 1900, and the bins were separated six feet, six feet apart with straight walls connecting the adjacent tanks, thus dividing the interstitial spaces for storage. The bin walls ranged from 12 inches thick at the bottom to 6 inches at the top, and were reinforced with the horizontal steel hoops that were 3 8 inch by 1 and a half inch, spaced between 11 and 18 inches on center. There were vertical bars spaced as required to align the, the hoops and support the formwork during construction. 
On December 12, 1900, as the elevator was being filled with grain for the first time, one of the outside interstitial bins failed, spilling grain out onto the surrounding field. It should be noted that the interstitial spaces of the elevator were filled while the main bins were empty. In 1901, the second half of the elevator complex was constructed with thicker walls and more re seal reinforcing. This half of the elevator complex did not fail. But in 1903, a second failure occur occurred at a different outside interstitial bin constructed in 1900. So what's the cause of the failures? Local uh, engineer C.A.P. Turner was hired to analyze the cause, and as part of his report, he explained the condition in which the interstitial spaces are filled while the main bills, bins are empty causes the bin walls to act as curved arches to support the forces rather than pressure, pressure, pressure vessels that one would expect. He concluded that the curved walls failed as arches, not because the curved walls were insufficient to carry the load, because the connecting walls were not sufficiently stiff as abutments to the arches. That is, when the arches were loaded, they caused the joint between the arch, the arch wall and the connecting wall to rotate, eliminating any negative bending at the curved wall connection, increasing the positive bending to more than the wall could resist, causing the wall to fail. Um, I'm almost done. That much longer. Uh, experiments conducted in 1920 by the University of Minnesota Structural testing lab confirmed that a circular tank designed for grain pressure will safely stand the same pressure on the convex side, but that a pressure should not exceed the pressure on the concave side. This is the test, a test rig that they had that, right there. He went on to say that the vertical reinforcing bars in the grain, bu grain bin walls, except as necessary for erection, were des detrimental to um, more detrimental than beneficial. While it wasn't discussed in the report, one would think that spreading the bins apart increased the pressure against the curved bin walls, contributing to the failure. It should be noted that this was not common in grain elevator construction. In conclusion, the 50-year period between about 1870 and 1920, when the convergence of new material, steel and concrete, combined with new technologies such as the railroad and a growing understanding of forces within the structural engineering community created a period of amazing structural and engineering wonders. During this time, the grain elevator evolved from a glorified storage shed filled with burlap sacks of grain to towering forests of concrete that stored and transported tens of millions of bushels of grain. Thank you. <laughs>